should we bother too much because you know the ecosystems what are they providing us apart from that they're nice and beautiful um so i wanted to dive more into that and i just did it's not anything to do with a mentorship or anything it's just my interest um so yeah i wanted to show you something about ecosystem services and human interference and my view on human interference in ecosystems is shown in this altered video of a coca-cola advertisement um, yeah, so if you just put, yeah, exactly. Okay, so we put something into an ecosystem and we get a product out. That's what humans do. But what happens in the meantime? What happens to this whole system interconnecting if we put something in? For example, that guy, something happened to him, but we don't know what's the chain reaction after that. Or this guy is losing his product, we take it out, and what happens to him? We don't know. The product is demolishing lots of stuff, and uh, this happens, we alter something in the whole system, then these guys, they love the product, they love it, and they love him. And we take it out, and what happens to them? We just don't know. So, and there's more stuff destroyed here, you have all these nice snowmen, so we destroy it to get our product nice and smooth. So yeah, that's just my idea of the ecosystem and how it functions, maybe. We don't actually know how it functions, but we're altering a lot of stuff, and we don't know what's actually happening when, when we've taken out something or when we put something in. You can see the end result, I mean, that was nice. But what happens in between? Um, in order to understand that, we'll just have to look into the ecosystem. I know you guys probably all know about it already, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. An ecosystem is actually a system in which uh, you have organisms in communities interacting with their environment and other communities. So you have all these interactions going on. So we start with our example, the school example of an ecosystem. We have the rainforest, we have plants, and they use light and water and carbon dioxide to create oxygen and sugars, and which is all really good. And they're eaten by uh, primary <coughs> consumers. Um, yeah, so that's all good, and the paper eats it. And then we have the jaguar community, which interacts with the paper by e eating it, incidentally also killing it. They poo. And we have bacteria, and bacteria love poo and dead animals, so that's all great. And they remineralize stuff, and the plants love it again. So we have this whole web of stuff interacting already. And this is a simple system. I mean, there are lots of other um, carnivores in the system too, which interact also with each other. Maybe they fight over the paper. So this is a simple ecosystem, just keep it in mind. Then the services. What kind of services can we expect? Well, one really easy one, of course, is food. You can just see the banana in the ecosystem, you take it, you're happy with it. A surface. Another one is timber, also easy. Logging. Everyone loves it from the forest. Um, one you might not think about too much is, for example, the pollution. The stuff we make, or toxic stuff that we dump somewhere, or accidentally flows out. The ecosystems are quite capable of, you know, recycling stuff and uh, yeah, getting it all fixed up again. Fresh water. They produce fresh water in a way and they recycle it. Then we have, of course, our carbon dioxide problem, which ecosystems are way happy to take up and yeah, solve the problem in a way, they buffer it. And of course, our recreation. We love ecosystems, they're nice. We can walk around in them, swim in them, it's good. So what happened? We can categorize these um, services. This is done also by the Millennium Assessment. So we get provisioning services, which is the, like the food and the timber and stuff, supporting services, regulatory services and our cultural services, which is also, it's got its own box. Um, okay, so I want to illustrate everything I found with ecosystem services, because there's way more than these, just, just imagine. I want to illustrate it with a couple of cases in which people did not think about what they were doing to an ecosystem and then found out suddenly that what they were taking out was actually a lot less valuable than the services that the 
ecosystem was already providing, and they got lost. So for example, this one, the Panama Canal. So it transports ships from one side, so the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean, to the other side. But it doesn't do it on sea level, because we have kind of a mountain range we have to cross. Um, so the ships get from one side to the other via water locks, like this. And the water provided from the water locks is not like pumped up from the sea or anything, it's provided by the lakes um, on top of the mountain. Um, so we need a lot of fresh water to get the ships from one side to the other. Actually, it's like 50 million gallons of water per ship going across. It's quite a lot. Um, and this is all very nice, and it was built in, uh, I don't know, 1930-something. Um, and this was nice for Panama City and Colón on the other side, and it was booming business, and when booming business is booming, then you have population growth. So we had population growth, which meant urbanization and industrialization and um, deforestation, unfortunately. So what happened between 1950 and 1980 is that the cover of forests went from over 80% in the whole area surrounding the lakes and the canal to less than 30%. Um, so what happened? One thing, you get a lot of erosion because this, this part is like a, so the tropical rainforest. Um, so you have a few months in the year, you have lots and lots of precipitation and the other months of the year, it's pretty dry. Um, and what the forest does normally is, so you have a tree with roots. Okay, and here I just draw a leaf. So we're in the tropics and the trees are actually hot, like we are, they, and like we are when we go there. And um, they transpire to get rid of the heat. They transpire just like we do. Um, although slightly different, they have like, um, stomata, um, and water evaporates from that. So we have a water drop here, which evaporates. And they have veins, like we do. Kind of. And every time a drop evaporates, it pulls onto the next drop, and that one to the next, and that one to the next, like a straw when you suck on it. And that way water evaporates into the sky heaps because the tree is hot, it's hot there, so you get lots of water in the air, creating clouds, lots of clouds above the rainforest, uh, and that precipitates again, so you have kind of this recycling of water in the tropical rainforest, and the roots in the soil also hold this water kind of in the soil, which is nice. So what happened when they cut down the forest? is that in the first place, the roots weren't there anymore, kind of, because the tree was dead, so the root didn't do its watershed service. Um, so all the water that actually came onto the ground in a hilly landscape just went straight down into the lake. Which is nice for the lake in the first place, because it gets lots of water, and that was good because it's needed for the ships. But also a lot of sediment gets into the lake, because it's not holded anymore by any root of any tree, because they're all gone, so sediment rises, which had a problem for the water locks because if the sediment rises in the lake, then you get suddenly a problem here and here. And then another problem was that in the months that it was actually raining, um, so you get all the water in the lake, but then when it was not raining anymore, you did not have your watershed because this was also gone. And also the rain recycling was less because we had less trees. So that was a little bit disappointing and also the water level dropped. So when they finally figured out what the forest was actually doing for them except for just giving timber, they realized, oh, okay, that's not a very good idea, so maybe we should reforest everything. It's quite nice. So this is something maybe you did not think about before, but then you find out when you start altering stuff that it's actually doing quite a lot for you already. Uh, another case. This one, a bog, a swamp, a marsh. Yeah. Who doesn't like it? You've got lots of mosquitoes. Uh, that was what the state of Louisiana thought too. So maybe we should just get rid of all the swamps, drain it, nice. Um, then you get hurricanes and storm surges, lots of waves. Turned out that the city of New Orleans was flooded. Yeah, well that sucks. And swamps are actually pretty good in kind of buffering all <coughs> the water. So the state of Louisiana 
invested $14 billion in rest restoration of all these swamps and barrier islands and stuff like that. Who would have thought that a swamp could actually do that? It's pretty amazing, right? Third case, also a nice one. This one's pretty old. Um, can you just click it? Yeah. It's about pesticides and... Oh, yeah, you should click the link. Okay. Uh, now I do uh, open another browser. And yeah, that should. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't longer. download this one. The name of the video? Oh, I got absolutely no idea. I think it's, it's something with BBC. Yeah, yeah. But if you just click it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Which number was this? Yeah, no, it was that one, but it's underneath of the picture. <laughs> oh, right. oh, maybe but you can just move the pictures, it's okay. Then the presentation is missed. Oh, it's already messed up because now you've already seen it, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's about an alteration to ecosystems in general. Do we need sound? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, that's going to be hard. hard. I've got some trouble with it anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, okay if there is no sound, actually. It's about <coughs> a pesticide that was discovered shortly after the Second World War, DDT, you might have heard of it, and it was like a miracle. They thought, oh, wow, this is good, we can protect our crops against pests. And they started using it on everything, like, basically everything. Um, and you can see the, um, the videos in, like, a second. There are airplanes going over all these fields and spraying the pesticide. There is actually a car driving through a suburb, um, getting like clouds of the pesticide into the suburb because it gets rid of mosquitoes. Super. It was used for everything, basically, like this. Good for the crops. That's what you want. Get rid of the mosquitoes. You get rid of every single insect. And it was used in large scale straight away, basically. Yeah, you can stop it all this stuff. Um, but what it also, so it did lots of harmful stuff, we found out later. Um, so it was harmful for birds, they called it the silent, silent spring afterwards, so all the birds, they, uh, they died when they got intoxicated by the DDT. And um, it also turned out that it was not so good for humans either, because um, the human fetuses, they got some kind of developmental problems and stuff. And uh, women's breastfeeding went wrong and, well, all unhealthy stuff. But what it also did, and what it was supposed to do, it killed all the insects. And also, bees. Well, that sucked. Because bees are pollinators. And you actually need them if you want to eat something. <laughs> For example, they pollinate kiwi, and onion, and broccoli, trout, <laughs> papaya, coconut, <laughs> cucumber, lemons, oil palm, apples, eggplants, tomatoes, and lots and lots more. There's like basically every flowering plant they pollinate. And um, so the DDT was already banned in like 1980 or something. They found out, okay, maybe this is not such a good idea. We shouldn't do this, maybe. But the bee thing is still a problem because in the United States, it's like a decline in the bee population over the past few years for 25% or so. And um, what they found out is that if you have a patch of forest nearby your agricultural field, like within a kilometer or so, then your yield goes up with 20% because of the bees. They're more abundant there, so your yield goes up because there's more pollination. So it's actually a good idea to maybe have some patches of forest nearby your agricultural fields and preserve those because it's important for your yield. For an acre of, or for a, a farm with coffee, coffee plantation of a thousand hectares, it is a difference of $60,000 a year if you are within or not within the one kilometer of the forest patch. Quite interesting economically. Um, so you had all these services, you do not think about straight away, but then after you've done something, 
turns out all wrong, ah shit, that was actually quite nice. Also economically, maybe we should restore it. <laughs> That's okay, you can do that. The only thing is that it takes a bit more energy to restore the thing than to destroy it. So, um, for example, this is the school example of uh, a nice garden pond, for example. Nice clear water, you have water plants on the bottom. You have uh, all kinds of communities eating the water plants and then all these communities also provide food for all kinds of birds around it. So this is a nice and healthy ecosystem. Then to change this nice and healthy ecosystem into something horrible, it's not so difficult. You just have to add nutrients because if you add nutrients, then all of a sudden these microalgae love to grow. They grow a lot. You get a algal bloom and then all of a sudden the sunlight doesn't hit the bottom anymore and we don't have any of these nice plants on the bottom, so we don't have our communities on the bottom, so we don't have our birds. This happens actually quite a lot with the phosphate um, pollution and stuff. Um, so this happens quite easily, we only have to add phosphate. Now how do we get it back? That's kind of a problem, because if you take phosphate out alone, it's, it's going to take forever, right? Because you still got these microalgae and you still don't have your water plants. So, this is actually, this model is called the hysteresis effect. And um, this is what happens in the first place. So you've got this nice and clear pond. And then uh, this is all the nice and these pearls represent all the nice and clear ponds. And these represent the horrible, dirty, yucky ones. Um, at the different nutrient statuses. So you start with a nice one with the nutrients and you start adding nutrients. And it still stays a clear pond until you have a certain amount of nutrients that it's easier just to go to the to the horrible state. But then to go back from the horrible state to the nice one, this one represents the amount of energy you should put in to push the marble over the hill, kind of. You can see that it can stay in this dirty state until some point around here or here, and only then it will go back to the, to the nice and clear state. So you need more energy to restore an ecosystem than to destroy it, which makes sense, I guess. But it's good to keep in mind because it means that if you prevent something from happening, it costs less energy and economically, I guess, it's better. Um, then to destroy it and then think, oh shit, maybe we should restore it. Um, luckily, a lot of people think so too. <laughs> so uh, this is the Millennium Assessment again, and they said all these, like the supporting and the provisioning and the regulating and the cultural services, all these ecosystem services, they gave some kind of value to it. So for example, the regulating systems are uh, very good for our security and our basic material for good in life and for our health. And these provisioning ones are good for security and basic material for good life. And the cultural ones are not so important, you could have guessed. But the sad thing is that a lot of people actually only think of the, the cultural aspect if they think of the ecosystem. So I think that's something maybe we should change if we want to preserve it. Especially if you look at all these services that people don't really think about. Maybe we should make them aware of that there is so much more than just a nice coral reef or a nice forest. Um, so yeah, that's why I wanted to show you the, um, the poll. Maybe you can go back to that and you can compare it. I think actually a lot of you chose for the bees, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea, by the way, what the services are of the Emily's Weir. I have no idea. <laughs> My point is more or less that it might be a good idea to investigate first what would happen if we expand the road there, instead of uh, just doing it and see what we fucked up later. Yeah. So, uh... Oh yeah, maybe. So my final take home message what I thought we, we should do as sustainable thinkers. Next one. Yes. Look before you leave or. Yeah, that's it.